My name is Jim Fallows from the Atlantic Monthly and from the board of uh, New America. Improbably enough, I was Eric Schmidt's predecessor as the chairman of the New America board. I often think of this succession as being uh, equal in history only by the transition from James Buchanan to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership opportunity. Yeah. Oh, wow. Break. <laughs> I was so, pleased to succeed you. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, we're glad to ha we have a wonderful session. I'm going to uh, sit down now, which I think will be an appropriate cap to a great day and a prelude to tomorrow. The topic of our discussion, as you know, has to do essentially with the internet threat or menace. Is it a, a tool for political liberation or for political oppression? oppression? And we have the ideal panel to discuss this topic, and I'll introduce them, and there are many uh, merits in a second. What's fascinating to me about this topic is that if we were trying to have this discussion when New America was being founded in the late uh, 1990s, we simply couldn't have had it, because the assumption would have been, by definition, the internet was going to be a tool for political liberation, just as electricity, by definition, made for a more uh, advanced and night-centric style of life so too the internet was going to liberate people around the world. And we all know, and these three people probably know better than any other combination of three around, how much more complicated than that it has become in the succeeding uh, decade plus since New America was, was, was founded. New America was founded then, Google was founded, uh, and many others. I was reminded just this week of the complexity. I was in Shanghai till about um, 48 hours ago. And I got checked into the nicest hotel in Shanghai. I wasn't paying for it. It was nicer than where I, I lived in Shanghai. And I found there were all these internet sites I just couldn't reach. And I had been away from China <laughs> that long that I, I had forgotten how much of the internet is still, still congested there. So we know that in the last decade that, that uh, the internet has often been a tool for sort of national balkanization of information communities. It's been a tool for censorship in various places, for their privacy issues and all the rest. To examine some of these questions, we have Eric Schmidt, not simply the, known to the world as chairman of Google, CEO of Google, known to us as chairman of New America and somebody who's been a very, very uh, um, influential, wise, and generous uh, patron of this organization and steward of this organization, organization for a long time. We have Alex Ross, who is the, the senior advisor for innovation. Is that correct at the U.S. That's Department right. of, of State and who was crucially involved in a very major uh, speech the Secretary of State made on January 21st on this very topic of the Internet as tool for political change for good and ill. And for Timothy Wu, we have, who's known to the world as a professor at uh, Columbia Law School, known to us as a Bernard Schwartz Fellow here in New America and a writer for Slate and who's examined these issues. You were one of the first people I met in Shanghai when I sure. first moved there four years ago. We had a... Uh, that was just before I got deathly sick and went to the hospital, but I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the, the, water, uh, the water I drank. Um, so I'd like to start by asking Eric Schmidt to sort of frame this question for us. I'm going to ask you the particular question about China. You know, I'm <laughs> shocked. <laughs> I'm going I'm 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 to put it this way, that, that as part of his explanations for why the company changed its policy, um, Sergey Brin was saying that we thought when we came into China and had this, this policy of uh, agreeing, abiding the Chinese censorship rules, we thought we would have a positive effect on China, and we see that that's not happening. I wonder what you can say to address the merits of that question, what you actually expected in China, and then more broadly how we should think about this freedom versus control issue. Well, just to give a, everybody a baseline, everybody understands the, inter the Internet interconnects everybody to everybody else, uh, but that's not actually quite true. And there are control points, if you will, technically known as routers. And China has arranged its set of routers uh, into something called the Great Firewall. And a firewall is something that can block things selectively. And China has also organized itself so that it has a, a very, I think all of us would agree, draconian censorship law involving sedition, where they get to determine what the criteria of this is. So this is, and this is not the only country where, for which this is true. The thing that's different about China is that their censorship requires active uh, censorship, literally every day adding things and so forth and so on, which is not true in other countries. And furthermore, the list of items is secret. It's illegal to reveal them. And I, not only do I not know it, but if I knew it, I wouldn't reveal it here for that reason. And people literally go to jail over these things. So, so it's the part, that's the part of the way they operate that we found distasteful when we entered the country five years ago. Our assumption was that by entering the country, we could move uh, information forward. Engagement is better than estrangement, better communication, 
uh, the Chinese citizens are our friends, and so forth and so on. Um, over a five-year period, uh, the company made a decision that we sort of reached a breaking point. And we simply, uh, there's this whole speech about China that they give where it's one country, two systems. We prefer the Hong Kong system. So we just moved. And the relevant technical point about this is that this great firewall that I'm describing sits between Hong Kong and the mainland. So Jim, if you had checked into your favorite hotel in Hong Kong, you would not have had this experience. Uh, and that is the situation that we're in today. And could you then also give your philosophy now, it, you know, this many years, if I'm saying that when New America was founded, we wouldn't even think this was an issue worth debating because of course the internet would be a tool for freedom. How do you now see the balance between tools of freedom, tool of control around the world? Well, my personal view is that the internet is ultimately the strongest force for individual empowerment and therefore freedom that has yet to be invented. This is my personal view. Um, you have a fundamental question as to how you want to attack that, right? Where do you want to place your bets and so forth? But to answer, and maybe you wanted to do this at the end rather than the beginning, but to answer the question, on balance, I would argue that today it's still a source of empowerment. And the fundamental reason is that there's never been a situation where individuals have as much power as they do today because of the combination of the digital revolution, mobile devices, the internet, and so forth and so on. And a number of us have talked about this today. Uh, I know you believe this uh, in the State Department and so forth. We don't really understand what happens when everybody has this level of power. But given my general view that human nature is overwhelmingly good, I think you conclude that it will ultimately be a strong force. Thank you. So um, I'm going to turn now to, to Alec Ross to just, and to ask you both to express your own views and the views of the U.S. government as were delivered by a Hillary Clinton in a major speech which was uh, given either fortuitously or by design right after the Google News broke and you could explain which of those it was and what is now the official position of the U.S. government and what the U.S. government will do to sort of enforce its position about where the internet is advancing freedom and what you're going to do but when you think it's not. Yes, yeah, so to answer your first question, it was, I think you could call it fortuitous. It was fortuitous. It was entirely. <laughs> <laughs> it was this enti is like my drama. Yeah, it was entirely. <laughs> it was entirely by chance. And I remember Eric saying, "I don't know if I'm doing you a favor or <laughs> if I'm jamming you up a little bit. It's probably <coughs> a little bit of both." So you know, actually, we uh, had the we had the speech scheduled before we knew, and actually, we were we. We were shared the information by Eric actually in a dinner that we hosted, um, where you know, he, he privately shared this with us. Where the purpose of our having the dinner in part was to help inform the Secretary of State's point of view on these issues. And you know, part of what she does is, as Ambassador Holbrook knows, is she's very good at throwing a, a broad net and then individually synthesizing information for herself. So, it was a coincidence, but but on the other hand, it wasn't. And 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 I would say it wasn't because. 2009 was the worst year in history in terms of internet freedom. So throughout the course of 2009, there was this constant drumbeat of the way in which the internet, which we had historically thought of as having an end, to end user to end user principle, you know, the way in which when New America was founded, we all thought of it. We increasingly saw over the course of the beginning of the Obama administration that nations, and not just China and Iran, which suck up all the oxygen and get all the attention on these issues, but where we increasingly saw that nations believed that the internet, the internet could, could function more like an intranet and something built to spec for its own communications ministry or for its own intelligence services. And so the Secretary of State, you know, as she saw what was happening in places as diverse as Iran and China and Moldova and the caucus, and just globally, she said, there's something happening here that while it's very contemporary, the internet is something that's very, that changes very quickly, it actually goes to values of the United States that are not decades long, but they're actually centuries long. The second, you know, the first Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, said the only legitimate foundation for government is the will of its people, and to protect its free expression should be our first order. And so, the you know, Secretary of State said, you know, today, digital domains are where these centuries-long values of ours are protected and promoted. 
And so it was really, it, it, so that, is, that was really the impetus behind this. Very briefly, what are we doing to now promote this? There are really, there are really four things we do. Uh, diplomatic engagement, monitoring and reporting, policy-related activities, and programmatic activities. Um, I, I'll, I'll just speak to the first, which is historically the work of the State Department, and that which we are normally best at is formal, formal interactions between sovereign states. And so the most important thing that Hillary Clinton did is that now when she sits across the table, mm -hmm. internet freedom is something that's on the table, and there's nothing more powerful that she could have done. Sure. And, and to ask just one follow-up about that before coming, turning to Timothy Wu, when the Chinese government says in response to that speech in particular, uh, number one, you're carrying water for this U.S. company, number two, it's not your business what we do, uh, what, what, do you, what does the U.S. government say back to them? Well, you know, first of all, I would point out that while Google was the company most associated with this, the point of origin of, of Google's decision or one of the factors in Google's decisions, I'll, I'll try to not speak for Google, but was based on a, a cyber attack against 30-plus American companies. So while the press principally reported this in terms of the actions by Google, part of the lens in which we viewed these issues was, you know, my goodness, 30-plus American companies have been cyber attacked, and, and, and this is a cause of enormous concern. As to the issue of, quote unquote, meddling in the, in the affairs of a sovereign nation, it has always been the practice and the policy of the United States government to promote freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, all uh, things like this. And in the 21st century, what that means is that these things live on digital networks. And so just as we were supportive of things like Samizdat during the Cold War, mm -hmm. to be supportive of Samizdat today means to be supportive of what's, of what's happening in the blogosphere, for example. Thank you. So, uh, Tim, we've heard from Eric that human nature is basically positive, so mm -hmm. that information will basically <laughs> empower people. Rousseau kind of. Yes, yeah. and we heard, we heard from Alec that this is consistent with the centuries-long U.S. values of liberalism, et cetera. Do you agree with those premises, and what is your sense of the net effect of the Internet right, now on right. the freedom versus control uh, front? Let me start by, by with an academic, longer view of things. Um, Longer except in temporal terms. You mean, yeah, yeah. You mean no, the, 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 historic, the historical term. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tendency for, for dictatorships to take advantage of, of new media. The uh, internet is about, mass internet is 15 years old, if we, 15 or 16 years old. So it's about where the radio was in 1935. And by this point in its history, radio, a new invention in 1920, had completely become the tool of tyranny and dictatorship. In, in Germany and in the Soviet Union. So you had Joseph Goebbels calling the radio the spiritual weapon of the totalitarian state. So the internet's doing better than radio so far. We can say that much. Do you listen to AM? <laughs> I don't <laughs> Well, I haven't <laughs> thought about that. On the other hand, so that, that's the sort of doing better than radio so far. Because there is this tendency, there's this plasticity. Yeah. And whoever has the power mm. will, and, and it's a repeated pattern, this is something I'm very interested in, of governments using new media inventions to further their own power. That has been the sort of classic pattern. Radio is the most powerful example, you know, with the Nazis, the Soviet Union, and so forth, and even a little bit the, F, uh, the New Deal. No. <laughs> Soft pedal that a little bit, a little bit. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, what's not, <laughs> what hasn't happened is what people, what you alluded to earlier, in the 90s. The record of the internet in, in uh, destroying dictatorships is, is bad. Uh, there's, there's I, I don't think there's a, State it has brought them down, and meanwhile, if you look at the, the dictatorships that have fallen, most of them fell in the, in the, in the late, nine, uh, late 80s or early 90s, where the internet was not really a factor. So in terms of having a track record, the kind of things Nicholas Kristof said that, you know, broadband is burying the Chi is, is putting to the grave the Chinese dictatorship, that just hasn't happened. So the track record in that respect is poor. And, so, and this is an observation you're making 15 years in. Do you yeah. spend it in the, the longer run? I'm, I'm giving you more air time now. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think the, the danger is that the internet will, and, and this uh, echoes what Alex says, and wh why what these men are doing is so important, is history would suggest that the powers, the people of power over physical force in this world will try to turn the internet into a tool of power and supporting state power, the greatest power we've known in human history. And so what we have to do in the next 15 years is try to break the cycle 
whereby most of these uh, once open, liberating technologies, radio in the 1920s was seen as you know, this incredible medium of freedom. It was going to make the world one community. Everyone loved radio. And within, as I said, within 15 years, it was being used to indoctrinate the masses all over the world. Let's just try and avoid that. <laughs> that that's what I'm trying to say. Right, so Jim, yeah. Jim, Jim <laughs> can I suggest that, that the question as phrased is about the internet, which is a question that you could have asked five or 10 years ago, but the answer can be understood as the combination of the internet, the devices that access it, and the new generation of uses that are just becoming visible. And I think the argument goes something like this. You can probably run a modern dictatorship without material access to the internet. You can constrain it and so forth. You probably cannot run a modern dictatorship without mobile phones. Um, as we learned on our, on our trip to Baghdad, uh, Saddam Hussein did not allow cell cellular phones into this country until after, after he was gone. But that's a pretty rare event. And every one of these mobile devices is now a gateway to the world's information. In our lifetimes, we're going from a small number of people having access to a small amount of information to every single person in the world having access to pretty much all the world's information. That is a very, very large change in this discussion. And it's quite different from the radio example because the radio was fundamentally a command and control structure, whereas this one is clearly not a control. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so the yeah, way to right. think about this is in order to really control this technology, you're also going to have to control the proliferation of devices, the proliferation of platforms, and the proliferation of applications, which are just beginning to be part of our daily lives. Yeah. Did you want to answer that? Yeah, which is yeah. why I think you have to be very careful about the, the state of the mobile platform, particularly as it begins to take over from the computer, or maybe becomes a computer, like you're saying. You know, the, the mobile platform, what you call it, which is the telephone, comes from a very different legacy. It wasn't invented by Steve Wozniak, and it was, it's not the Apple II origins. It's AT&T at the core of it. You know, the old bail system, the, 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 it is, the telephone has always been a more controlled device than the computer, is what I'm saying. And there is the possibility that the old computer internet stays very open. But the mobile internet centered on devices, I don't want to name names, but maybe <laughs> like the iPad or <laughs> you know, more controlled <laughs> devices, yeah. um, is just fundamentally different than the computer internet. And I think that's a real threat. Now, Android is the kind of, I, I, is, is fighting against that, but uh, there is a threat that the mobile internet will f be fundamentally different. And I could add to that in the radio example. One of the things the Nazis did that was so effective is they designed a radio that only received <laughs> German stations. <laughs> they designed a radio that only had two settings, you know, German station one, German station two. And what we have to do is make sure the mobile phones don't become the same damn thing. They white, you know, they have four sites on them or something like that, because it could happen. The technology is there in the mobile platform, and we just have to fight it. The net neutrality battle essentially was lost in the 30s on the radio, and you know, it sounds like this thing that only geeks care about. But I think it's a fundamental issue for free speech that the mobile phone be like the open computer. Uh, has this issue occurred to you, Eric, of openness and flat? <laughs> You're doing a good job of describing our strategy. Uh, <laughs> You know, again, you, if you take a, a sort of a strong view about openness, which is indeed the view, my personal view, as well as the Google's view, then it's not a perfect outcome. Did you say the Google's view? Google's view, that's right. <laughs> yes, Mr. President. <laughs> um, God, Jim. Um, so much for our friendship. Um, the, uh, if you... How, how, <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> I can ask Alec a question sure. if you'd like. <laughs> I do, I, I do want to say one thing about this, which is interesting. People think about some of these issues as being so very current. Um, and, you know, Tim's bringing up basically the open versus closed frame. Tonight's discussion is only the most recent discussion in something that I would argue goes back 2,400 years to the founding of the Library of Alexandria wow. in the third century BC, where if you actually look, at the trends of the, the trending of conflicts between open and closed societies. The most of the basis for a period of a thousand years of science and technological process was based on the innovations that came out of third century BC in Alexandria, which was a remarkably open society where the Ptolemies um, encouraged 
uh, religious and cultural pluralism, where they encourage uh, academic openness. It was where anatomy, alchemy, geometry, and all such things flourished. When did that end? I would argue that that actually ended on a very specific date in 215 AD when the Emperor Caracalla came to visit um, Alexandria, saw that he was being satirized, satire being an exemplar of openness, and as he saw himself satirized in 215 AD, said all Alexandrian males of fighting age and younger will now be put to death and burn down the library of Alexandria. That must have worked. <laughs> we saw this. We saw this then. For the we we saw this then, you know, hundreds of years later. People who take a Eurocentric view of the world call a certain period of time the Dark Ages. Well, concurrent to much of the Dark Ages was something also called the Islamic Golden Age. Why was there an Islamic Golden Age? There was an Islamic Golden Age in part because in this place called Baghdad, there was this remarkable tolerance and this remarkable openness that fostered scientific and technological pro progress. It was there that algebra took root. It was there that the number zero became a concept. And, and so you see these cycles of open and closed societies playing out. You know, the, the best known example, of course, is, is the ending of what essentially was the Dark Ages with the creation of the printing press and what then followed, which was the Age of Enlightenment, the Protestant Reformation and such things. And so one thing that I think is important to keep in mind as we think of issues related to internet freedom and open handsets and such things as being something that's so very current and so very cutting edge, I would argue that it's actually one of the oldest political phenomena known to man. Um, I'm going to open this to you all's questions in just a moment. I had a specific question for both uh, Eric and, and Alec to, to follow up on for, for Eric, and also I will um, offset my cruel comment about the Google's view by saying that the reason <laughs> Eric had the repartee of saying, Mr. President, was not simply the provenance of that line uh, the Google with George W. Bush, but as Eric knows, the curse of my life when I was living in China is that um, facial distinctions don't really cross racial lines very well. You know, any middle-aged Chinese man is uh, Jackie Chan in the U.S. Everyone in China was sure I was George W. Bush. This was I'd make white chat with taxi drivers. You know, now you mention it. I've never thought about that. Well, uh, so that, that I make that, that confession. Now I'll uh, ask Eric, another aspect of the possibly unliberating effects of the Internet that are, that are much in the news, including all the various applications, are the privacy implications. You know, companies, including yours, are collecting more and more and more data. How will this balance be struck? Uh, this is going to be, I think, the defining issue in the Western world for a very long time because the systems that are being built naturally collect data that could be misused. And so I think every one of these societies is going to have a very robust debate about what to do about this information. I'll give you an example. Everyone here has their mobile phone on, right? Your mobile phone, by the way, knows exactly where you are. It has to for the E911 services. Does that bother anybody here? For most of you, you probably weren't aware of it, and it hasn't been an issue. It hasn't been used against you and so forth. Why? Because there's a whole body of law and practice with respect to that kind of information. Uh, so you start thinking about a world where you have everybody has a camera, everyone's phone can be tracked, everybody has a GPS, the GPSs can be logged. A classic example is uh, I'm sitting in Google's a strange place, right? So you're doing a product review and this very young product manager is getting up or engineer stands up and he says, let me show you what I've built. And he's built a product which will, um, you turn it on and it will exactly track your phone and keep exactly a record of where you are, tell you where your friends are, and predict where you're going. <laughs> and I go, oh my God. And I, I actually fell out of my chair at the end of the day. Now, wow. he thought I was ecstatic <laughs> because he had invented this phenomenal product because he didn't understand the implications. And I said, can you imagine the subpoenas? <laughs> Again, engineering, engineers often uh, stumble into that. So I think we're going to have this kind of story over and over again. Uh, by the way, what we did is we, we built a product called Google Latitude, just as a sidebar, um, which allows you to do something similar to what I described, but it also allows you to misstate where you are. <laughs> uh, you can also turn it off. So it, that was how we solved the problem. And I think, I, so I think that we're, as a society, we're going to debate it. This is not a decision that's going to be made by companies. It's going to be made by countries. 
Countries will make decisions differently. I'll give you another example. When you're in London walking down the street, street you're almost guaranteed to be on a, tele on a camera. Mm -hmm. Here in America, you're almost guaranteed not to be. Mm -hmm. Each country has made, each fine democracy has made a very different decision on something of great importance to personal privacy. And I think we'll see that in privacy legislation, and I think this will go on for a very long time. Right, thanks. A, a quick question for Alec. When, um, Secretary of State Clinton is in China now. She's going to be grilled about why a group associated with Falun Gong is doing some of these internet anti-firewall um, tools. W what's the explanation for that? Well, I mean, first of all, we live in a free society, so people within the United States can start organizations to do any of a variety of things. And, you know, our, I don't think our Secretary of State has to be held to account for it. Um, so, you know, that's what I would advise her. Is she should be held no more to account for what the... Global Internet Freedom Coalition, which is this Falun Gong associated organization, is doing than what the Tea Party is doing. You know, <laughs> she 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 can explain such things, but she shouldn't be held to account for them. Questions from our assembled dinner uh, group. Yes, and wait for the microphone if you would. Sasha Meinrath with the Open Technology Initiative here at New America Foundation, and you can imagine my biases <laughs> on technology. Um, and my question is really one of uh, chains of silver versus chains of iron. And I'm thinking back to actually what Tim Wu was talking about, about the 20s and, and the rise of the Nazi party and the, the conglomerization of, of their radio, uh, which was well put by you. And I think, so what's the US parallel? And that's the FCC, which took the radio out of the hands of a vibrant amateur community and put it into the hands of corporate culture. And fast forward to, say, post-World War II and realize, like, well, Nazi system, really bad. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have this, like, international declaration of human rights. We're going to have Article 19 saying we're for freedom of communication and information flow irregardless of media and frontiers. This is 1948. And it's clearly uh, very relevant to today's uh, debates and arguments Which leads you to the question... <laughs> which leads me to the question, which is this, which is that we look at other countries and we, we wag our finger at them and say you're using you know, deep packet inspection and all these nefarious technologies for, for ill will. And in the United States, we have parallels, not, not identical, but parallels. Like, you know, we look at the ways in which we enforce intellectual property and copyright and et cetera. Which, which raises the question. So <laughs> the question is just, which is, uh, what can we learn about what we're telling other countries that we should implement here locally? Oh, I see. We learn things. Uh, I thought you were going to ask a different question. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to ask, I'm going to ask the question you, I thought you were going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, what's the equivalent of the United States? You're a politician you know? in the making. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you fit right in in Washington, buddy. I was born here. It's a little known fact. Anyway. Good. Um, which is what the comparative danger in the United States. I'll just tell one. I, I'm full of these sort of historical. I just finished this book, uh, that, my, The Master Switch, which is all about the sort of history of all these same things. And um, in America, it's, our danger is private censorship, I think. Um, if you look in the, in the 1930s, the film industry became a film industry is extremely vibrant industry. So I'll make this quick. In the 19 teens, 1920, all kinds of content, very, you know, very interesting. Anarchist, socialist, right wing, left wing, very interesting. Uh, it becomes very consolidated into the, what we call the studios. And the studios, they didn't really care about content either. But the difference is, because there were so few of them, they were subject to a Catholic boycott. They were very easy to pressure into adopting a production code. And so from the mid-1930s through the, the late 1960s, you had probably the most oppressive censorship system in American history, completely run by private forces. Everything had to be, every movie to be made had to be sent to the Catholic, uh, 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 the production code authority, and they would say, this film does, is made. Or, so it's exactly what law professors or lawyers call a... Uh, 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 well, I should know this. I'm a law professor. Blocking speech before it comes out. <laughs> prior restraint, sorry. <laughs> well, that was embarrassing. Anyway, prior restraint. We had a full-on... It's being webcast, buddy. That was very embarrassing. We had a full-on... Uh, <laughs> Smile to the camera. Yeah, yeah, this, is the be th this is the real benefit of YouTube. We had a, <laughs> 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 a full-on prior restraint system in American film for 40 years. A full on something we, is absolutely the opposite of what's supposed to happen in American constitutional law. A complete prior restraint system for all film for 40 years. And it was all private censorship because of industry consolidation. So that's my answer to the question there. Thank you guys. So 
question. <laughs> yes. Okay, question yeah. over here, yes. <coughs> yes. Actually, I want to follow on that, Zachary Carabell. Um, what is the difference when we talk about freedom of expression between constraints that every society places on freedom of expression, so whether it's internet sites in Germany being blocked when they cross some line about neo-Nazism or uh, sites throughout the Persian Gulf that cross certain lines about Islam or uh, issues that we have in the United States, whether it triggers certain national security issues around terrorism or child pornography for that matter. When we go abroad and try to talk in terms of those freedom of expressions, when we live in a world where there are always and have been certain what we decide are legitimate constraints upon it, the fire in a crowded theater issue, and when we are no longer in a world where power of the Western world can also dictate that morality, how does that discussion unfold when, when we are you know, trying to preach that set of values when we have always practiced a certain set of constraints? So I'll, I'll answer that very briefly, which is to say you have to account for the complexity of the issue and the nuance. This is not a binary issue. Oliver Wendell Holmes what made a very compelling point you know, when he talked about you know, freedom of ex expression does not extend to someone standing up in a crowded theater yelling fire. So the important thing is to not create a caricature of our values and then espouse them as such, but to account for um, the complexity of the, of the issues on a country by country basis. Um, you know, there are examples that are taking place right now that really call into question um, the value and virtue of, of, uh, of freedom of expression without any additional synthesis and analysis. And so what you have to do is not travel you know, around the globe and say freedom of expression, freedom of expression, freedom of expression, and leave it at that. The, the conversations have to, be, have to be balanced. We have to recognize that the internet can contribute to both the promise and the peril of the 21st century. It's important to not be cyber utopian. Now, I am as big a cheerleader about the power of the internet as anybody. You know, I've, I've you know, spent the 10 years prior to coming into government making sure that technology could get into the tools of low-income people so that they could compete and succeed in a knowledge-based economy. You know, I'm a cheerleader for these tools. But what that doesn't mean is that you then just say, okay, we can sprinkle the internet, internet on everything and we're going to grow up to be ha happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. And when we engage with our global interlocutors diplomatically, we have to account for the nuance um, with, within these issues, uh, exactly as you expressed them within your question. Anything else from either of you? So I think I've seen two or three other hands he here. And uh, so I think actually we may be reaching the lightning round stage. So, so Dan, you can ask actual, actual question, then we'll have some, uh, three or four summarized questions. Two very short yeah. but related questions. Uh, you were talking about the empowerment of individuals with the internet. Relating it to Ambassador Holbrook's uh, uh, pre-dinner, uh, your insights and uh, thoughts about the use of the internet by people uh, like the Pakistani Taliban and the ability to organize and use that uh, to tie the two together. And the related thing is how likely is it, you talked about there were attacks on 40 companies, 30 companies, how likely is it in three years there will be a New America Foundation meeting like this talking about the consequences of the devastating cyber attack uh, on the United States? And what I'm going to do actually is, is collect a number of these questions. So we only have about five minutes left. So let's collect uh, four or five questions and we can answer them seriatim. I'll keep notes of them. So we have Taliban, we have cyber attacks. Uh, so here's question here, and actually you can project to, for the, if, uh, so yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Soros, I'm on the Leadership Council with the New America Foundation. I want to just ask you to extend your last answer to Jim's question, uh, which you answered in the, in the context of privacy in a Western context, but the same data amounts to prosecution and persecution in the repressive context. So, uh, you know, really just to extend to that context and, and whether it changes your view on the balance between freedom and repression uh, for the internet. I'm noting these down, so I think we're here, yes. So, so actually, why don't you, oh, okay, you'll check, yes, so over, uh, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, just project. We'll have Alec, I was just ask, yeah. gonna ask you about, you're talking about how the internet can help in diplomacy, but also, how, have you used it to engage the American public on foreign policy priorities in some way? 
Okay, well, let's take three or four more, and I will let our microphone man, Andrew, choose. Uh, yes, over, he over here, yes, just project. Uh, so, uh, Lenny, uh, project. Yeah. So, how did you treat Fox on Twitch and Instagram? Are they longer than Jasper's Fox no. on mobile? Is that a beginning of perhaps some of your interchange with technology beyond your radar? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, okay, far, yes. And, uh, yeah. 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 So, so one more quick one over here, then we'll have two from this side, and then we'll have the answers. Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. We got the issue, yeah, great. <laughs> yes, right, okay, uh, and yes, John, yeah. Uh, <coughs> and, and great, thank you, and yes, and, the, and this is our last one, yes. Um, hasn't Google a non-Westphalian actor declared belligerence on a sovereign state <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and then declared an alliance with the NSA an intelligence arm of the United States does this mean that Google has become a supranational independent actor does anybody have control over you uh, good okay here just to remind everyone here what, what okay one more yes uh, these websites, do you think that there are instances where um, in the issue of national security or, or public safety that it's appropriate to, to shut down such websites? Thank Here you. is the list of topics, and then these are for <laughs> discussion over the rest of our lives, but you can choose which ones. Okay, there's the Pakistan Facebook case. There's what this means for the Taliban and the uh, Afghanistan-Pakistan frontier. There's the three years from now devastating cyber attack. Uh, there was um, something about, I just wrote down as repression. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, uh, the, the, um, uh, there's the, 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 the ep episode of the woman who was killed in Iran. There's the Internet as tool of voting. There's the NTI broadband. There's NSA. There's Google as tool as supranational uh, being. And there's the role of the, uh, the for-profit press. Uh, choose a topic, each of you. And there's one or two I left out. But you may each choose one and a half. Mm. <laughs> we've we've slept our panel. As Eric says, this is what I'll, YouTube I'll is go, for. I'll go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to speak specifically to the, uh, to the um, question about Nita, um, the young Iranian woman who was killed. Because I, I just want to, the, the actual story behind what happened isn't widely known. And I think it's illustrative of some larger truths which might be informative. So Nita um, is this young art student, 20 some years old, who was murdered. Um, by Iranian security forces during the, during the violence in the Iranian election aftermath. And what's interesting about that was the image of Nita lying dead uh, on the streets of Tehran was captured on a cell phone. It was then emailed to, an, we think, emailed to an Iranian in the diaspora, we think in England, who then got it to mainstream media, and it then became viral over our global communications networks over multiple platforms. What's interesting about that is that that image, that symbol of resistance, is, is one of the things, was without question the single most dominant, most galvanizing image um, within the Green Movement. And it was something that wouldn't have happened, wouldn't, it, it would not have um, 
become a global phenomenon 10 years ago because the fact that Western news cameras were kept out wouldn't have allowed it to happen 10 years ago. And so I think that in thinking about how technology is empowering, we can think about how the average Tehranian can, you know, half anonymously get this kind of content out there around the globe. And, and one person I want to acknowledge here is a colleague of mine, a brilliant young colleague named Jared Cohen, who, you know, quite famously, one of the things that he did right around this time was contacted some of our buddies at Twitter and pointed out to the folks at Twitter, they had no idea that Twitter was being used as a way for um, the resistance in Iran to self-organize and communicate. They had no idea, but Jared knew. And Twitter had a scheduled maintenance that was taking place then, and, and Jared um, didn't ask them to do anything, but he called them and simply pointed out this fact. And they chose to keep Twitter up during that time. And, and what, what's very interesting from a, the standpoint of statecraft, and, and for somebody like myself, is, is that these technologies are increasingly taking on NGO-esque like qualities mm. and are taking on roles where historical where, where they aren't value neutral. And going forward, I think we're going to see increasing cases of this. And so discussions like this one. Um, I think you're going to become all the more mainstream as we see the increasing intrusion of information communications technology into our foreign policy. Which is a perfect segue to the uh, Google as post-Westphalian well, superpower. Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked about the, yeah. the Facebook case of Pakistan because right after that, YouTube was banned. Mm -hmm. And I'm always suspicious about these broad bans because the government will shut down. Remember I said that there are these routers at the sort of nation boundaries and the government just stops it and they can do it. It's a violation of the internet principles, but they've obviously decided to do this, and they have the power of law. Uh, and in every case that we've looked at it, they've done it for the official reason, but then there's another reason, and the other reason, the, un the other reason is there's an awful lot of political criticism that they also happen to be blocking at the same time. We saw this in Turkey, we saw this in Thailand, and so forth. So I'm very, very suspicious uh, that there is a, a legitimate case where you'd have to shut down a whole site for a genuine security issue. And uh, I can tell you that we are, we Google are very much subject to the laws of the United States and the laws of all of the <laughs> other countries that we <laughs> occupy, <laughs> that we occupy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so Tim, do you want to answer um, the internet voting or anything else, or we can wrap maybe wrap maybe the cyber. Well, I, I kind of found none of the questions directed to me, so I could say anything. But no, I'll talk about the cyber security thing if that's if that's uh, and if that's we'll, yeah. yeah, I don't know if Occupy was quite the. No, yeah. just it, it was <laughs> a joke, guys. <laughs> Where is you all sense of humor? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the audience got it, Tim. <laughs> You're still working on the radio. He's a DC guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> All right. So, 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 um, so quickly, is the cyber threat overblown? Uh, I think yes, and I, I, you know, it's exciting to read about and stuff. But I, 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it is overblown, and I think what the the problem is that fears of things like a cyber attack are part of what could drive the open. Net internet into a closed internet. Um, open systems tend to be very rare in human history. They, they show up for these tiny periods and everyone loves them and then they, they close again. And uh, with the media, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, you have the radio, as I said, you have the, the film industry. They have these brief periods. And what these men uh, here are doing is trying to protect. Uh, an internet was very ide idealistically founded. You know, had these crazy ideals that everyone should be able to reach everyone, kind of be a universal language for everything. Ideas like that tend to get destroyed, trampled, and you know, people laugh about them later. So what's going on? I'm serious. I, you know, utopian visions tend to be turned into dystopias or tend to be, to be destroyed. And what these men are doing, and what you know, a lot of people are trying to do, is, is realize that you could very easily lose the open internet without even kind of realizing it. And partially because you want things like better cybersecurity, or you maybe you kind of like YouTube to be a little higher quality. And, yeah. Wouldn't mind yeah. if someone really sort of blocked bling bing because it kind of sucks <laughs> anyways. It's, you, know, nice. you know what I mean? It is kind of like it kind of erodes <laughs> and it all, and then it, it, it's uh, you don't it's miss also those radio in the stations. Joke yeah. category, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so th there we go. And the last thing I want to say is I blame my lack of memory on goddamn Google, which has ruined my memory because I can look everything up. <laughs> 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 All right. So there's, there's 20 <laughs> seconds standing between us and adjournment. I'll use that 20 seconds to, to address your question, which is that as I try to argue in my current uh, article in The Atlantic, the spirit of experimentation, I think, will reinvent the press as your own organization shows to find new sources of profit. So I think it's the press at the moment, rather than being passing floor 50 on the way down from a 100-floor building, is instead a sort of a low point of a, of a, of a curve, but more on that later. Um, there are m things we could discuss for hours and hours, but please, right now, join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs> Now we have Steve.